Um, so um, this is going to be a little bit different than what we did last time. Last time we had a full list of questions uh, that I presented to the mentors. Um, this time uh, I don't have a, a hard set of questions. What I really like to do is um, similar to the mentor office hours that a lot of you have been participating in, you know, chime in with the questions that you have. Um, and uh, for the, the mentors on the line, we're going to try to keep it to um, about five minutes uh, per question, um, just to be uh, aware of time. And then we can, as we've been doing, cycle back through people if they want to come back to something again. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I have uh, stacked the deck a little bit in terms of I, I, I picked out a couple people that I can rely on to uh, give me a good question right off the bat. So. Um, Aaron, uh, why don't you go ahead and unmute? Um, and uh, I know you've 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 been on a couple of the uh, mentor office hours, but I think every time you've you've had some kind of conflict pop up that's that's taken you away. Um, so why don't you go ahead and, and pose a question for the mentors? Um, for the mentors, as I said in the email to you earlier, what we'll do is I'll ask for someone to chime in first. Um, and then if you want to respond to this, send me a message through the chat and let me know that you're interested in responding to this question. Um, and then we'll try to keep this to, to five minutes per question. Okay, so with that, Aaron, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, appreciate it. So uh, in the urban environment, are there any particular technology challenges that uh, you all have faced or seen in regards to identification of friend or foe? This is Bob. Um, I'm going to throw a question back at Aaron, excuse me. Is that uh, in, uh, you know, free space on the streets or is there any kind of defilade or, you know, the challenge of seeing through uh, structures or both? Um, let's go with both. Uh, we, I mean, we're working on this, um, to, but really interested to hear further input from the operator uh, perspective uh, in regards to some of the technology that's out there and what you guys are uh, would like to see. Tim, do you want to say something? Yeah, so uh, Aaron, um, start my stopwatch. So uh, on that note, one of the big troubles that everybody has is, uh, especially from a distance, so maybe as an example, if I've got an airplane in the air and he's looking down with a sensor, I'm getting that that uh, information and I can see what he sees. So it's hard to tell because all I'm looking at is live video feed, right? Of who's good and who's bad. And there's a couple different ways that you can kind of fix that problem. But also think about this. Let's say that we're in a battle space or even in a environment where we're trying to uh, deal with um, a catastrophe such as an earthquake. And I've got first responders everywhere. At the moment, if I'm out in a battle space controlling these folks, pretty much I know where my guys are because of where they tell me. So if somebody gets hurt or somebody gets pinned down, it's going to be kind of hard to determine that. So uh, something I would like to see as a, an operator on the ground is a way, uh, a, a very simple sensor means, however you want it to communicate through GPS or through satellite uh, or through uh, SATCOM or through mesh or just point to point, but a really, really simple way that I can pull up a, an ATAC device, right? Pull up an ATAC device and then go, okay, where are all my bubbles out on my map? That way, if I know that if, you know, if Justin's missing, like we ain't heard nothing from Justin in six minutes, his battle buddy lost him. Maybe he had a, a burning building piece fall on and maybe he got shot something. I can look at his last recorded dot and send guys to go find him. So something just as simple as that would be a huge game changer. And is that something that you currently do not have, correct? Can't talk about gaps in capabilities. So Understood. I, yep. It's apologies. It's fine. Um, okay. Steven, did you want to chime in on this? Thank you, Christopher. I'll try to keep it short. Uh, basically, almost all sensors are neutral to what their their data. So whether it's uh, uniforms that we're seeing with our with our eyes or electronic signals that we're picking up with the sensor, it's up to the receiving end to interpret it. Um, and right now, we really only um, can work on what we can put onto the ground. So we can make our guys dress in a certain uniform or do certain tactics, and we can um, tag our signals a certain way, but we cannot force the enemy or civilians to do something that allows us to then identify them as that. So if you can come up with a solution that would, you know, allow us to identify or interpret the data of what is not tagged or what is not uh, identified through our means, then that, that would be pretty ingenious. Appreciate it. 
Hey, this is Pat Mahaney here. Quick comment on that. I won't address certainly DOD gaps and uh, seams and, and capabilities, but I will say this. Uh, from a first responder point of view, firefighters, police, and obviously there's no national fire service in the United States. There's no national police service. FBI is a different thing altogether, right? But you don't have that, um, the equivalent of, say, a, a real effective blue force tracker for particularly uh, interior situations, in particular dense urban environments. So you have the ability, as Tim had pointed out, for people to self-report where they are. There are some tracking devices that are out there, but um, if it, the gap in seam had really been addressed, um, I think it would be understood much more broadly. Again, there may be niche capabilities out there, but um, it's something that's applicable to pretty much anybody. And uh, uh, particularly from the fire service uh, point of view, specifically FDNY, um, I could tell you that it's a, it's a significant downfall that you don't have that equivalent of a, 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 a blue force tracking beacon for an individual, which ideally would be something like maybe an RFID tag or something something worthwhile and how to pick it up. But that, that really is not in effect in general. Okay. Appreciate it. So while, uh, while the enemy or the civilians don't necessarily, uh, sorry again, this is uh, Josh Steele calling, I'm on the road here, so I won't be looking at you guys and talking. Um, while they don't self-identify with uniforms and call themselves out, uh, I wonder what sort of digital signatures they're already voluntarily, voluntarily contributing to the signals environment that would distinguish themselves as uh, friend or foe or civilian. And if I could simply see the cell phone devices, because the uh, probability states that if I'm in an urban area, the uh, guys that I'm facing off against probably have cell phones. If I could simply look at where all the cell phones are, at least know where everybody is, that's half the battle. Half the battle is knowing where everybody is, and then you start to determine friend or foe. If you can go one level deeper and determine, oh, these six cell phones, they're talking to each other, whether that be Bluetooth or whether it be they actually like text each other, okay, that's kind of a group of people that uh, are grouped together, then another group is grouped together, whether it's a family or whatnot, you can start to identify at least grouping which then by their positioning and just understand basic tactics, uh, you might be able to figure out who's who in the battlefield. So I think the adding in the blue force tracker aspect, uh, which we kind of have to a degree with the signals environment to detect, which even in a fire, uh, most people got the phones in their pockets. They might be climbing towards the wall with their get to the window or try to get out with the phone. I think people will self-identify via signal if we can find a way to tap that. Yeah, let me just amplify that comment and in a specific uh, issue that is wrestled with frequently, which is the Z axis. So you may have the correct street address for any building or it could be something like Grand Central Terminal and you figure out what part they're in, but figuring out what floor they're on is something that is not wildly, widely available and it is uh, something that would really be great because that would give that capability to say, okay, where is this person? Whether you're using the cell phone or anything else, that, that precise geolocation on the Z axis, positive up or negative uh, underground is, is a big part of this more broadly. Okay. Um, Got it, appreciate it. Move us on. Uh, Aaron, thanks a lot. Let me know uh, if you've got a, another question um, when we, uh, we move through this. Um, so I'm gonna mute you. Thank you all. Again. Um, all right, I've got one more person that I've tasked with asking a question. That's John Tasfield, who was the last person who got to speak on the AMA last time. Um, so, John, you usually have a great question, so go ahead and uh, let us know what you got. So, <clears throat> so we started um, thinking about two things, which is kind of uh, SIGINT holes, I guess. So. Uh, we know that sometimes, you know, you might be expecting to see a lot of uh, a lot of information. Is that is, is that in and of itself useful? Um, say you're in a big urban environment and, you, and you're not seeing a lot of noise. I guess the the other one is also going to be looking again, kind of the other way around, which is um, having spoken to a few guys. You know, obviously, if we're thinking about the future. Um, you might have a, a closer to a near peer or um, an adversary that's looking for particular signals. So some VARTEC is dependent on uh, emitting some energy into the environment. Um, and I guess just trying to work out, uh, you know, if you have to uh, uh, emit some things, then, then what is it? We know from the fire service 
that say like a, an emergency pass along um, kind of almost supersedes everything. If that starts going, then then uh, um, you know action starts being taken. Um, is there kind of that sort of structure? Because we, we've spoken a lot about what sort of RF there is and, uh, and how a lot of information is currently conveyed in voice and sort of moving towards data or kind of updates and pings and, and various other things. But um, uh, just trying to think about is there, is there sort of a, um, would, the, would it be acceptable, I guess, if there was one system that, that was sort of pinging out status because um, that's almost sort of an easier way because you know, at least then, you know, they were okay at this point in timestamp, so they go beyond radio range or comms range, that at least you kind of know within a timestamp that they, they uh, uh, you know, they were okay. And then ideally, if there is a problem, be able to sort of beam that back and, and just try to get my head a bit around that, which is, is there already something in place for that or, um, uh, uh, you know, equivalent to like a pass alarm for uh, um, f for guys out in the field, um, and if that were to be a thing, how would that work? If you're kind of um, worried about signals, I guess it's kind of how how you guys are turning on and off your kit um, because it kind of plays into uh, some of the tracking work that we're doing. That um, the actual sensor itself, because it's emitting some energy, um, you know, if that were to become then a problem. Uh, uh, and, and how that might be navigated. So, um, uh, for example, there's a guy dealing with foot-mounted IMUs, which have some advantages because uh, they're very passive, or even a chest-mounted IMU. But then if you can supplement it, you get a better image and a better picture. Um, so I guess that's it's not fully formed as a question, but it'd be interesting to hear um, what can be discussed on that. All right, who wants to go first on that one? Uh <laughs> is this related to um i mean this this uh looks and smells like one of the questions that we pushed out on kind of communications uh i think it's been rattling around a bit in my head which is um it's all very well being dependent on lots of active sensors but what if you get into an environment where where that's a problem so for example with the fire service we're looking at ultrasonics but actually, you know, you can get a little $8 ultrasonic that'll pick up quite a lot of information. And I guess just thinking about, well, you know, so we go and build this thing, you know, what the risk is of it, of it then not being viable because other tech has caught up and then you're in that kind of arms race, I guess. So, so obviously you can switch this stuff on and off in context, but say we were to then look at like an emergency system that can kind of ping out information is, how you then reconcile those different things, which is, is it on, is it off, is it that an intermittent, is that an intermission in that update of information and, and kind of what do you do? Or is that just part of the, the training, I guess? So um, I, I, I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna answer that in detail as far as, uh, but what I will, at least my, my, my two cents, um, you know, kind of um, camouflage of, uh, of signatures is important. Yep. Um, and coming up with any novel idea to do that, um, you know, in a, in a, in a rich EME, uh, electromagnetic environment, um, is, is, uh, is definitely an, an, an interest. Um, but just for the sake of going down into, uh, uh, sensitive areas there, um, I'm not gonna, I won't elaborate on that more. Uh, that's fine. I, I, I accept that. I had, a, I had a feeling that might be the case, but, um, uh, it's interesting to, to, to understand. So thank you. Tim, did you want to pose a question back to him? I just wanted to get him. Uh, I think he was trying to ask about if I'm in a comms denied environment. Is that the question that you have? Like an enemy may be tracking me? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, th th I guess there was two things is, is say, um, so there's, there's two things here. One is, if, if you're, say, pulling in RF signals, so, you know, you expect when you're going into a high rise, there's a bunch of uh, mobile phones and, and you're in there and you're not really picking anything up. Is that, should that be a, um, you know, is that a caution, I guess? And then the other way around, which is within that sort of um, um, what emissions you can use, what, what's the priority of, say, an emergency signal saying, you know, I'm, I'm in contact or, you know, is that worth breaking comms? 
because the val the value in that I guess comes from um, um, kind of automation if you can then sort of send out or, or ping that information and, and I guess I'm just trying to weigh it up in terms of is that a good thing to be looking at and pursuing and you can then resolve some other other of the complexities further down or is that kind of a um, you know does that present too big a risk that you wouldn't want to have that that sort of system I guess it's a good question. However, we're getting into capabilities and TTPs again. So the, this is the direction I'd like to push you in. And that is, what is your MVP? What is your most viable product? Because remember, I don't need a Corvette today. All I need is a car that goes from point A to point B. We can make it a Corvette later. Now, if your product is a sensor that, that uses a combination of passive and active, or it only uses passive or it only uses actives, just get it off the ground and go for it that way. If your solution is just strictly a, hey, how do I, I don't want to do the sensor piece. Uh, I don't want to do blue, blue force tracking in a normal city. I want to do it in a comms nine environment where the enemy could be watching me and still not find me. So I think, I think the best way to kind of push you in that direction without giving any, anything away, I guess, as far as operationally is go back to where your MVP is, stay focused on that, get it up off the ground and move it forward. Cause you don't have to solve all hundred problems at one time. Yep. You just solve one and then you can modularly, if you've programmed it right, and if you've built it right from the ground up and it's modular, then we can stack modules on it later on as you get further down the road. I hope you don't think I'm shutting you down. It's just- No, you're, no, you're no, no, it's good. It, 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 what what you said there kind of tallies with some other findings, which is this is enormous space and we need to we need to be really cautious about which of these problems we pick and not, not try and shoulder or worry All about of them. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Don't try to solve everything that the, that the hackathon's addressing right now. Pick one, two things maybe, and, and and run with it. Don't let it bog you down trying to trying to do it all. Cool. Thank you, Jim. All right. Thanks. Thanks, John. I'm gonna uh, actually go over your compatriot who's just raised his hand um, and see if he's got another question he wants to add. Yeah. Thanks, man. Um, yeah. Thanks, everyone. Um, it's, it's 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 part part observation and part part question. So so forgive me and bear in mind, as you all know, it's uh, it's coming up on uh, we'll be on twenty twenty nine hundred now. That's uh, twenty one hundred. So I've had a couple of drinks. Um, so uh, my my question is how how much do we want the system that we create to be able to link up to a higher authority? So we we seem to be talking about uh, a tactical system that we're in we're in sort of squads and teams fours and eights and twelves and communicating between that but if if it all goes horribly wrong you want to be able to get that data up to up to a spooky uh, up to up to a fast jet uh, how how do you so how, how do you envisage that the systems that we're talking about building are going to go up to those those communications and my observation is 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 working on what what to what John just said is that I, I'm just I'm just curious about at the moment we seem to be almost almost because we keep on talking about New York because we're, we're talking about going to New York that we seem to be talking about an urban environment that is uh, like a first world urban environment and the systems and sensors that we need for that but we were on a call just a couple of hours ago with people that I know are on this call now and we were talking about Gothic Serpent we're talking about Mogadishu where you know, the bad guys, the only thing they, that they had that was emitting were some mobile phone communication. So I'm just wondering about the systems that we build here. Are, are, we, are we trying to build something that can work in any environment from a, from a third world environment to a first world environment? Or is there an expectation that we're now looking to, to build for a, a war of the future that we expect to be in a sort of first world urban environment? So I've got like three people in mind that I want to have answer this question, which would be Bob, Pat, and, and Matt. Um, so whoever of those three wants to go first. I'll just throw it out there that uh, it's dense urban environment and it is not specific to a developed world scenario at all. Uh, I would quickly point out that, and you pointed it out, that in the case of Mogadishu, there's a lot of cell phones out there. What we're finding is every dense urban area, certainly every mega city out there, you've got a lot of cell phones. So it opens up what some of my colleagues have talked about. Um, the, the reliance on first world infrastructure, I, I think, is not part, necessarily part of this uh, hackathon whatsoever. You should very much uh, consider uh, whether it's Dhaka, Bangladesh, or a, another sort of um, something much worse like a Mogadishu. Uh, it does not, in fact, 
uh, need that sort of infrastructure. I would just quickly point out though that um, the thing, at least I'll speak first person, when I consider these types of environments, it's the commonalities that really strike me, right? There, there are plenty of differences and, and level of development is certainly one and penetration of anything from cell phone towers to uh, whatever. But they all pretty much have certain characteristics that we're trying to get at. It's multi-story uh, structures in particular. Some are taller than others. Some are modern high rises, some are not. Uh, and underground facilities. And honestly, it's, uh, it's that, it's the amount, it's, it's concrete, it's the physical environment. So it is not specific at all. In fact, here in New York, when we do any work here for you know, experimentation, we normally try to negate out any New York specific or developed world specific capabilities uh, as much there is. Uh, the only thing I keep in mind is that the more developed the city, the busier, the more congested the electromagnetic spectrum is more likely to be. But no, it, I, it's for any dense urban area. Over. Matt, you want to go? Uh, I, I mean, Pat, Pat's exactly right. I mean, first world, second, third, uh, everybody has cell phones now. Everybody has access to the internet more or less, you know, on a sliding scale, the more developed you are. But those same signatures are everywhere and, and multi-story buildings densely packed together. It doesn't matter what part of the world you're in. So sure, we focus on New York, but you can transplant a lot of those features all over. So I think Pat's right on with it. Only thing I'll add uh, for, for really every every part of the challenge too is, um, you know, uh, when, when Tim hit it before of, you know, don't try to uh, swallow everything and solve everything. Also, you know, if you're looking at a, a use case for yourself uh, or trying to figure that out or develop it, it should be scalable, but I would start on kind of the three block range where everything, you know, as, as dense and population structure, information, um, whatever it may be, um, but but always think uh, if if you show that concept, prove that concept out, uh, demonstrate that successfully. There are always means to to bring that up to scale. Um, over. Tim, you had sort of a comment about um, disasters and stuff. Uh, it was just what it said. Yeah, I've heard somebody bring this up before about which one to focus on, and that is that remember even in a first world where you have the best infrastructure on the planet, okay, if there's a disaster, that infrastructure may not work. So you might as well be in a third world country with no infrastructure system there. So kind of think about that. Yeah, I agree with uh, everything everybody said. I think the materials of the cities are pretty, uh, pretty similar. Um, cell phones you've got everywhere. I, I kind of swing it a different way. I think there's two sides of the coin that we should as well. Uh, one side of the coin is our own communication. So whatever communications are left or whatever there is, whether that's a mesh network between all the phones talking, and that could be civilian phones too that we're using for relay between each other or back, uh, or whether it be cell towers that are still working or whatever it is, how do we slave or work through whatever communications is left, right? So that's one piece uh, that would be really useful. Uh, and it gets you to look at the environment and the future. The other side of that coin, though, is then there's so much data. I don't think the issue will be connectivity even in a disaster environment. I think it's going to be so many signals still pingy. Uh, and on that side of things, I tend to think rather than software that connects me to everything or slaves everything else, I need software that sorts for me for situational awareness, right? So we talked about the position of phones, phones that are actually talking to figure out who the bad guy group is, good guy group is, um, who the civilians are. I think we start to move towards machine learning and AI. And while I may not need higher headquarters, that may not be the focus, having a server stack somewhere uh, that's sorting through all that signal of information to give high probability this, high pro probability that is definitely a way of the future. Um, so again, that would be a small piece that someone would handle or try to solve this environment, but there's two sides of the coin. One, harness them all, two, filter them through, through them all the plant that's useful. All right, thanks, Josh. Um, okay, uh, Alex, uh, you get your question answered? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think the only thing that um, I, I raised there was how are we thinking about communicating this data up to, uh, up to support elements? So, you know, close air support always hugely desired in the in these situations um, and in fact you know, clearly in a dense urban environment even more challenging about where you want to put want to put that metal 
Um, and I just wonder, are, are, are we thinking about how this system that we're going to create here, how it's going to integrate into a JTAC system, into, into those types of systems as well? As a quick answer, I would say if, if you can structure that data in a way that's communicated to, at the tactical level, we will be able to figure out a way to get it where we want it to go. But the priority is informing those leaders at the tactical level. Uh, okay, Alex, uh, we'll, we'll come back to you if you got another question later. Um, Fabio, you've got your hand up. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. This is, this is more of a, it kind of mixes with the programmatics here. Um, and that has to do, so we're, we're now starting to coalesce into some, some potential ideas in the team uh, that we want to move forward. And I know that at some point I'm, uh, I, I will want to answer one question regarding, you know, some of the metrics, you know, I know we're not going to be there to, uh, to present physically and it's yet to see how we're going to, we're going to present our, our solutions or our ideas. But uh, yeah. do you guys have any metrics uh, that you're going to evaluate our work on that could, could give us a little bit more insight into how we should structure our solutions? Yeah. And again, this, yeah. this could be for anyone, including you, Justin. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I can talk about that and Mark can talk about that. Um, so so it's, a, it's a very timely question because uh, Mark and I have been talking about this directly actually today um, and we're, we're putting together uh, an information sheet for all of you um, that includes the, the timelines for when we need you to submit things, uh, what we're looking for from you to submit, and the evaluation criteria we're going to use to assess uh, the pitches that you send over um, in terms of how, who we're going to select to bring out to New York. Um, so, so that information should be out to you early next week um, at the latest. I, I, I'd be shocked if we get it to you later than um, Tuesday morning next week. Um, and, and is there any, like, do you, do you foresee some questions that, like, at the top of your head that you think it could be, uh, you know, we could start thinking about in terms of uh, uh, answering as far as evaluation? Yeah, I mean, the, the, right off the bat is the, the first thing I'm going to ask you to think about is how, how is your solution responding to the challenge that we've posed to you? What, what is the actual impact of it? And uh, clearly articulating what areas you are you're solving in terms of the focus areas that we've put forth. Cool. Thanks a lot. Very insightful. Yeah. yeah. Any, other, any other questions, Fabio? Any other sort of uh, more operational questions? Uh, no, I, I, I think, um, I mean, per, there might be one or two re regarding still the environments and how we tackle them, but I, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take a pause here for a second. No, okay, who wants to? Um, all right, uh, Bill Davis, you've got your hand up. Hey guys, a uh, quick question um, regarding our tech solutions. Um, uh, I would like to know like your, your feedback on a low tech option for the guys approaching the door. Like, does it, does it make sense if we have an option that is super low tech, doesn't transmit anything to, to prevent, you know, signals being picked up, it doesn't emit anything. It's just like, hey, I need to get eyes inside. And it's more of like a, would it make sense if it was like a physical device just to kind of help uh, the operators just get eyes either upstairs, downstairs, past the door. Elijah, do you want to you want to chime in on that one? Yeah, I would just say the simpler the better. Um, it's just the ease of use, uh, durability. Yes, the simpler the better. Really, ultimately, point you back to the challenge statement. If you can provide us a capability that accomplishes any of those tasks in a simple means, that's a huge win. Yes. So yeah. Bill, if I could actually pose a question back to you, like how sure, simple sure. are we talking about? Because like Tim, Tim just posted in the chat like a mirror under the door. Um, I mean, that's that's a pretty simple solution, um, and it's one that actually is is used. So um, yeah. So I mean, uh, so imagine it's it's taking something similar to that type of concept. I mean, uh, I think even in um, some uh, the call that we had uh, yesterday, we were talking about some some similar type of capabilities, but um, 
they're like a little more elaborate than like, oh, I'm just going to stick a mirror on their door or I'm just going to put a camera on a stick. But it's like more robust where it's kind of like, hey, you know, this is a collapsible type of thing and I can have eyes up there. It's it's not a drone flying around that's going to be, you know, complicated or noisy or, you know, I have to look at another screen because um, I was talking about it with Lido yesterday offline, like, hey, you know, like, what if we had a system where we're just like, oh, this thing just telescopes out. I could like like a periscope, you know, just pop up, get a view, look around. It's like retract it, you know, silent, but uh, you know, simple, effective, uh, probably, you know, capable with your night vision or just, you know, look at peek through it with your eyeball, you know, just or maybe have a camera in there, but like try to make it low tech, uh extend it out. You know, you can uh, mount it on a uh, Picatinny rail or just stick it in your pocket type of deal. Hey, Justin, if I can just jump in. Um, yeah. Just remember, there's no there's no requirement necessarily for a tech solution. It's a requirement for a capability. Um, right. And I'll steal from what Captain Christopher just wrote in the, the um, chat there. Weigh that capability that we get against the burden it places on the warfighter. So if it's, if it's a low-tech solution that gives you a minimal capability, bare minimum to see, but it's a huge burden because it's now a new piece of heavy gear, you have to weigh that effectiveness versus something that is a more high tech solution, but can be integrated on something you already carry. So that's, that's my two cents on it. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, definitely looking towards something that's going to be super lightweight, but portable. And, uh, you know, if you could rail mount it, then it's uh, on the left side, then it's out of the way. So instead of like looking through your, your, your site, when you want to, you know, shoot someone in the face, you like turn to the side, oh, I could peek through, extend it out. Good to go. It, and I would just add that there's no shortage of high tech and low tech potential solutions to some of these problems out there. The, the difference in the capability that we're trying to outline in the challenge statement is the ability to collect the data and then help make an inference to inform a, a decision by an operator or a leader. Like that is not very easy to do, um, whether it's high tech or low tech, that's the capability we're kind of looking for. Oh, correct. Yeah. And then like the second part of that would be, okay, so, uh, so we use this, uh, you know, we're calling it kind of like a hockey stick, right? Cause then your vision goes up and then around the corner, but then after you like breach like that first room, then being able to have uh, a device where, okay, now I've got my 360 view and then that, that hops to the mesh and then that pushes to the JTAC. And then, and then with that, now that you have eyes on the inside, then the JTAC can, can start uh, plopping things into um, ATAC saying like, okay, this is important. Or if the uh, JTAC is acting more of like the GFC, the ground force commander, then then he has like eyes on the inside to help coordinate. So I, I guess I'm saying like um, our solution might involve a low tech initial for the guys um, uh, by the door. And then after they get in um, incorporating a kind of like a vision system for that uh, last mile connectivity. See a bunch of nods. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Bill, any other questions? Uh, no, that's it for me. Appreciate the right. feedback. Uh, okay, um, anybody else have questions? Um, actually, Dan, oh, Alex, one second. Let me ask one person who's on, I know was on the phone, and so he can't raise his hand. Dan, did you have a question, Dan Mo? This has been very interesting and has addressed a lot of questions I had. Let me, you know what? I don't right now. Okay, um, that's fine. You don't have to. I just want to make sure that, that you were able to pose a question if you had it. Understood. You don't I have appreciate all the functionality that, when you're on the phone. All right. Uh, and then I'm going to ask these other two call-in numbers, which I think one might be Tony Cress, and maybe one is Ernie, so I'm not quite sure. Uh, but there's an 862 number. Uh, did who who is that? Oh, this is Tony Crest. I'm in on I one of the numbers. I, I knew it. I got it. You're gonna meet you. Ernie, Ernie, uh, I don't think dialed. Uh, I don't think Ernie was able to call in. Okay. Over. Okay. Thanks, Tony. Uh, and then there's a a two five six number ending four four six nine. Uh, who is that? Yeah, this is Blaine Schertz from Aries Security. I'm just uh, uh, listening in on this one and okay. uh, don't have any questions okay. at this point Great. in time. Thank you. Thanks, Blaine. Yeah. Yep. 
All right, let's go to uh, to you, Alex. You got your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. A um, couple of quick things. I'm just thinking about the difference between the moment before things go noisy and afterwards. And I'm I'm thinking from everyone that's on this call from an operator point of view, and we're going to have a solution. We'll try to build a solution. There's a there's a way in which you can build a solution which is incredibly useful in that in that deliberate attack phase, where uh, it's an HRT situation, whatever it might be, where you're stacked up, you've been given a good briefing, you're stacked up on a door, uh, and, you, and, you, and you, you've got a moment, you've got an ability to collect quite a lot of data and take that, that pause moment, and then you go for the moment when it goes noisy and you're, and you're clearing through an area. And is, is there an opinion on, on a balance of, of what's most useful? Because I can appreciate that, and some, I think one of the other guys said this, I think on a meeting, uh, yeah, the other day, you know, once you once you're looking through the weapon site, you know, you're just using that to squeeze the trigger, um, and so you know you don't want any more data through the weapon site beyond the ability to to shoot whoever you want to shoot. So, is there an expectation that what would be most useful is is data collection in that very sort of pre-tactical moment of of tell me what's in this building? Give me a good read so I can brief. I can I can read back to my team, and then we're going to clear through, uh, as opposed to a kind of a real real time experience, a sort of a much more of a video video game experience as you go through the environment. Yeah, I um, I like to comment on it. It came up uh, one yesterday too, and to to break it down, there's probably just easily thinking about it. There's three levels. There's uh, someone literally facing off, looking uh, down his sights, right? They can probably see the enemy. There's a ground force commander who may have multiple maneuver elements. Um, and he's trying to figure out, he may have critical resources too, like canine units or EOD units or uh, additional squads to reposition, right? And uh, then you've got the higher echelon of command as well. I, I feel like most of what we're interested in, the, in the blindest part, uh, because you've got UASs and other things at headquarters you got the guy that can see the enemy in front of them is that ground force commander that intermediate that's trying to see the whole situation and different than like a police hostage situation where uh you probably got one threat or a small group of threats uh in a single building in this case in urban warfare against urban areas you may have multiple threats multiple directions uh the enemy may be maneuvering because he's willing to maneuver because he has more firepower than anyone else you may have different objectives so how do you build that situational awareness for the ground force commander who has additional assets to move? And maybe that's pulling a squad back so you can fire a bigger munition. Maybe it's committing another squad. Maybe it's flanking them with someone else. Maybe it's committing a critical resource like a canine unit. So um, seeing inside the whole building, seeing the whole picture, seeing two or three streets in front of you or around you where maybe people have barricaded things is some of the situational awareness we really like to see develop for ground force commander. Thanks, Josh. Tim, I think you wanted to weigh in. Yeah, so, uh, you know, you, you had mentioned if it's, uh, I call this left of bang, right? Once we hit bang, now we're on a time schedule, whereas if we're prior to bang, prior to kicking in a door, prior to sending those firefighters into that building, uh, we've got a little bit more time to plan. So commander's going to watch as much information as he has time to understand, okay? Or even me as an operator, if I'm running a bunch of partner force dudes, I just want as much information as I can understand to get the best decision made. Now, once bang happens, once I kick in a door, once that firefighter is the first guy inside that, that window, once that uh, paramedic is the first person into a crowd with an active shooter, okay, uh, at that point, there's two things that are considered, risk of force and risk of mission. The only information that I want, if it doesn't have to do with those two things, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't care about it. Risk of mission, is it information that will allow, that will cause my mission to fail or succeed? I need to know it. If it's information that gets my guys injured or killed, I need to know it. So try to think about it that way. So when it comes to right of bang, concentrate on those two things. And then prior to bang, you can really widen out that information. Now, I'm not talking at the like the, 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 the Death Star level. I'm talking way down at the X level, on the X. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Hey, uh, Clay, you wanted to, to weigh in. Yeah, I just want to echo uh, Colonel Fields and, and – uh, um, I started various comments um, and, and just, I just refine one aspect of that. Right. So I'm, I'm by no means like a tactical psychologist, right. But there's people that make their jobs and you guys may have covered some of this. 
but there's people that have made their careers over understanding uh, what we would call um, split second decision making, right? The, the OODA loop, the, uh, the uh, R4D process, some of these, the amount of the information that can be processed in the midst of a uh, life or death decision making incident, right? And so just to get a little bit more granular to your point, Alex, I think that you agree with what Tim is saying with regard to risk to mission and risk to force and almost you know, again, boiling that down even further to the point of, um, of incidents is shoot or no shoot, right? So with regard to uh, some of the stuff Elijah's already covered, the identifying characteristics of um, man, woman, child, um, armed, not armed, um, threatening intent or posture uh, or disposition, and non-threatening intent, posture, disposition, right? And, and then as those align with your rules of engagement. So Again, the, the human mind, as I understand it, can really do two things uh, under a second uh, at a time. Um, so really just keeping that cognitive load, which I think you know, gets back to some of the stuff you were asking, um, what can we expect the human mind to do under a high stress, um, high stress, low time horizon, um, understanding that uh, the more bandwidth you can give back to that shoot or no shoot decision, the more likelihood that that operator is going to make the right decision uh, when it comes to um, the situation before him, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Can I just quickly jump up, just one quick follow-up, uh, and it might be a bit controversial. How much are you willing to have this system to incorporate a bunch of AI, and how much, so that which in itself might begin to interpret the situation for you, and how much do you just want raw information that allows you to make the interpretation, given that we're talking in often cases split-second decisions? This was brought up actually in my uh, this was brought up in my office hours and there's a there's kind of a common misconception that commanders are worried about being replaced by AI and computers and they're not a commander has advisors on ODA he's got 11 of them okay so all of us have our own specialties I advise the commander the commander takes my stuff into decision he takes Bob's stuff into decision he takes Justin's stuff into decision then he makes a choice based upon us advising him so think about that as an additional advisor for the decision maker. It's never going to replace my ability to make a decision. I look at it as it's advising me with more data, just like any of you other guys would. So the more information that it can get to me, the better. The smarter that it is, the better. The more that it can interpret data that makes sense, that it's allowed to, the better. Does that answer your question? No, that's pretty good. Thank you. It, this is Bob. I'll just jump on Tim's comment, too, is... Uh, so the more the more information you can fuse and filter and and reason out to give that uh, decision maker, you know, very very clear informative um, information, the better, right? So now we're back on the mass amount of data. What's important? When's it important? How long is it going to be important? What do I look at next, right? In such a dynamic environment, um, the AI machine learning comes into really filtering through all that, giving it brains, and then passing it to uh, the human uh, for to make that decision. Hey, Serge, you, uh, you have your hand up. You want to weigh in on this? Yeah, so uh, I see that there is kind of consensus of this one, but um, I, I would like just to clarify a thing, because Tim, you started in saying as, as much as I can understand, but where we are explaining that actually there's not much that we can understand in that short amount of time. And I would say if the system is actually doing the job of sorting out what is relevant and what is not, that would be wonderful. And it's difficult because I think, uh, as you explained, is it uh, relevant to the mission to be able to, to sort it out? You need to understand the mission too. And so when you, you are talking about the AI, actually we hope that the AI will actually understand the mission enough so that it will filter out and will not feed us with too much because the effect of having more than you can swallow makes that you will not swallow everything. And if you're lucky, you've just swallowed what is not useful. And that's terrible. Just got one comment on that, that point there, Sergey. And, you, you know, again, accepting the fact that, back to Tim's point, that AI becomes a liability if it's a black box. I'm sure you guys have covered that enough, you know, in terms of liability for the decision-making process. You know, will always, the human in the loop will always probably be the recommendation, in, you know, in the coming future. But comma that said, the human brain responds to different visual cues with more ease than others, right? So, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, if there's a way for that, it, for that sensor to identify all of the different aspects of, you know, whether it's the the uh, atmospherics of the body, the pulse, some of the various indicators that would show fight or flight intention. 
followed up with the position of the hands, you know, relative to a weapon system or relative to uh, the feet, you know, a posture to move, not move. And it can then flip from like a red triangle to like a, you know, a, a, a green circle or something like over, overlaid on a field of view. That'd be something really interesting to see because the mind can easily process go, no go in that regard. Comma break that said, understanding that creates a liability for the operator who then says, hey, my AI, my, my algorithm messed up and now I'm liable for a bad shoot that I was interpreting through an augmented piece of reality. So there's pros and cons there, but I would say, again, really getting into the cognitive psychology of what is um, e most easily processed by the brain is, is a good vector to kind of explore here. I'd recommend a, a program called MCTI, Mission Critical Teams Institute. They do a lot of good work uh, in that regard. Now, if I can jump in again, uh, understanding the mission uh, is, of course, situation dependent. It could be different every time. But there is, I think, one information that always relevant is, is there any danger for me in that place? And answering that question would always be useful. Yes, the, the basic questions, threat, no threat, and what's the, if it is a threat, what's the nearest non-threat or civilian to, to help you make a decision? But threat or no threat is the basic question. Hey, Stephen, you, you put a comment in the, the chat. You want to weigh in, give a Marine Corps perspective? Matt, I think it's a little redundant, but everyone's already hit on it. The human in the loop is necessary, but human machine teaming is the way to go. We have to figure out how to integrate a machine doing some of the interpretation for us. But I'll just say, uh, finally, that whatever we information we are getting, the ground, uh, the warfighter on the ground needs that information to be interpreted and displayed in a manner that makes his decision making quicker. But he also needs to understand the flaws that are potential in that decision making. So if the if the technology or the, 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 the thing is interpreting something for him and he sees it as a human, as an example, he needs to know what other faults could have created that, that, um, that in, incorrect image or incorrect interpretation so that he can then still can carry on with uh, an AI doing his decision making or interpretation for him. Cool, all right, thanks. Um, hey, John, you got you. One more piece to this is uh, the terrain, right? So friendly, enemy, threat, right, and terrain. So that's one of the biggest things we're dealing with in the dense urban area is what's inside all those buildings that I can't see, right? The number of floors, things like that that we talked about. And I think the terrain itself is a place where we can make big money with AI or machine learning, right? So uh, we know that that takes tons and tons of data, but we also know we could enter in tons and tons of types of building and floor plans into a supercomputer to make that machine learning you couple that with the drone who's taking, who's, who's doing live video, feeding its data into this, the shape of the building, what it's seeing inside the windows, and all of a sudden, uh, AI could probably get you a 90% solution on layouts for inside buildings just based on probabilities and what it knows from learning. Uh, so I think the terrain and inside the building, uh, AI might be a might be a good path there. All right, thanks, Josh. Um, all right, let's, uh, we got one more question, and I think we're, we're running up on an hour. Uh, so, John, why don't you go ahead and uh, ask your, your question. This might be the last one. Uh, so, the last point was really interesting because um, what we found with the floor plans is that there's a big disparity between what a floor plan tells you and what the internal configuration is. Um, so, for example, with the fire services, there's a uh, a defined percentage of hoarders in the world and it's really interesting that kind of dynamic that it, that it's more of a we 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 our, our perspective it's more of like a a bounding box and a guideline than a than an absolute truth we can't keep kind of going around in that cycle so it'd be really interesting to pick that up um uh, as a simple simple one this one was that we started then thinking a bit about um uh the human machine interface and how you'd indicate certain things so the obvious sort of go-to is to start looking at um, uh, NATO-type iconography um, for where's my guy, what does he look like? But I guess my, my perspective is we, we've also strayed into um, the sort of, sort of UDA-type territory where you've got a, a very short processing loop. So the, the guy that we've got in mind for it does a lot of um, uh, supercar HMI design where it's super, super fast, so it's super lean in terms of the data, I guess. I guess it's just trying to understand, is, 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 is that already something that's been evaluated and, 
and looks at and whether we could potentially try and leverage that that the you know the the smallest possible icon that you can pop up to show friendly in the short, shortest amount of time that's sort of visible rather than us trying to re-engage with that as another path because uh, on the surface it's not much but then you've got to get into this complexity of um, cognitive loading which we know uh, from our work with the UK fire service they've had to engage with um, a bunch of uni folk to actually kind of work on similar programs to what um, uh, excuse me I forget the name uh, you, you were talking about in terms of that rapid decision making when you're when you're down in the second range do you want to go Basically, we started thinking a bit about heads-up displays because you've got a complicated map and then you actually just want to decant that into what is the guy who's about to go through the door door's going to see, you know, how can I reduce it down? Um, and, uh, you know, there's lots of different philosophies. So it'd just be interesting to know if there's something that already exists that we could look at. You're asking a capabilities question again, John. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> Sorry, brother. I just, uh, everybody's just kind of sitting here like, well, uh, yeah, you know what I mean? Uh, I would I'm, say anything I'm you can find. I'm not the party. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, it's fine, man. So anything you can find through open source, dive into it. There's plenty of projects out there that you can find on Google that the DOD is doing that are probably going to help you answer that question. Um, what I would say is this. Uh, go to any video game that you've ever played. We've got a HUD from Halo to Ghost Recon, okay? And every one of those HUDs had something that pissed you off about it. It was either too much or not enough. And if your solution is to come up with a new HUD system that you can put on my eye and show me and then go, hey, like ATAC, check it out. Here's the basic format, but you can customize this thing however you want. If you don't want a compass on the bottom, if you, if you do want a reticle that pops up, if you want an arrow over here, that's, that's whatever. So I think to answer your question is, if there is something like that already, don't know. However, make something better with what you already know and experience because a lot of our tech is drawn by the future, right? I mean, there's a great documentary called how William Shatner changed the world. And that was scientists going to trying to make stuff they saw in Star Trek. So I would say if it was me and you said, Hey man, here's a HUD that you can see your teammates, you can see bad guys. Like it does all this stuff that we've already talked about. My first question is like, all right, cool. There's a bunch of garbage on here. I don't want, can I customize it? And if you go, yeah, then you get a high five for me. Does that kind of help? Uh, it really does. This is me just with my uh, project manager efficiency hat on going, can, you, can, we, uh, can we build on the shoulder of John's kind of thing, I guess. But uh, uh, the answer is much the same we get from the fire services. It depends. And if I can customize it even better. You got it. Because anytime you send me a product and ask any military guy here, whatever the default configuration is, it always sucks. I don't know how. I don't know why. I don't know who gets it before I do. But the first thing I do with a weapon system, the first thing I do with a, a computer, a piece of equipment, a radio, is I take the bitch apart and customize it. So we're going to do that anyway. So if you build that with that in mind, I think that you'll be better set up for the future. All right. Thanks, Tim. Um, all right. So it's, it's 5 o'clock. Uh, I know we've got a couple of people who just joined us not too long ago. Are there any other questions out there from the, uh, the group? Maybe someone who hasn't asked a question already. Um, if not, I am happy to wrap this thing up. Yes, Bob Hess says it's beer time. I agree. Um, so I'm going to give count of five. Five, four, three, two, one. And I'm calling it done. Um, so all right. Thanks, everybody, uh, for, uh, for joining us. Thanks for the great questions that we got. Um, and, uh, you know, feel free, of course, reach out to us at any time. If you have more questions, we'll be doing a lot more of the mentor office hours going forward. So that's going to be a really great opportunity for all of you to engage, uh, with the mentors. Um, we'll post this up, um, on YouTube, hopefully, uh, relatively quickly. So you can come back and review it again. Uh, but with that, everybody go have a great weekend and, uh, and we'll connect up again next week. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a good one. Thanks a lot, guys. Cheers, everyone. You will.